Hello and welcome to the 24th video in this series of programming videos on a chess engine in C. So this video we're going to start looking at the setting up of a move and the first thing we're going to do in defs.h is we're going to make a new structure and we're going to call this, oh, this structure s underscore move and this is going to be our move type so this will store when we make a move list of moves available in the position the move and it's going to have two integers one of them the move and the other one the score and you'll see when we're searching in the game tree why we have a score there but we use it for move ordering I shall take that space out so we use the score for move ordering move here though this integer stores all of the information we need for our move and you'll hear paper in the background because I've had to make some notes on this to make sure I get everything right. Okay, so it's important, really important to understand how a move in our game is actually structured. And to do this, I think actually I'm going to go above macros here and I'm going to make game move a section here to explain it. So the first thing to realize is, is in our moves we can have is the least the lowest square number 21 and the highest square number 98 so bearing that in mind when we have the bits for a number the first bits 1 then we have 2 4 8 16 32 and 64 and we can already get 98 with the 64 plus the 32 plus 2 so that means we need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 bits to represent, up to 7 bits to represent a move. So if I put something in some comments here, and let's have a look at how we might think about structuring our move. Now what I'm laying out here are 6 columns of bits. So 6 fours are 24 bits so each of these represent a number now I'm assuming in this that you're familiar with hexadecimal because this is where hexadecimal really really helps if you're not then you can search on the web I've done an article on it I think on the website as well I'll put the link in the video in, uh, in the description for this video but basically let's take the lowest four bits of this number so this whole number here is 24 bits and let's take the lowest four bits here and you already know that if I set this to a one then the decimal value for this number is one you know that if I set this to a one as well the decimal value for this number will be a three because this bits worth one this one worth two if I set both of these to a one then a decimal value for this number will obviously be 15 now that's all fairly self-explanatory but say I set the bit worth 16 here and the bit worth 1 here, then we know in decimal that that's 17. And we still work things out fairly quickly looking at the binary until we start setting the bits much further up here, which obviously are worth a huge amount as things keep doubling. This is where hexadecimal really comes into its own. The hexadecimal value for this number here would be 11. And the way you should see each number in a hexadecimal number, and I'm sorry if you already know this, but it's only a very, very quick overview, is each number represents a block of four bits. So 15 in hexadecimal, so all four bits, is an F. So if we had this number like we're seeing now, that would be a 1F, because in this block we've got 1, and this block here we've got an F. If we say had this block set to 9, then this would be a 9F. If we had it set to 10, like this it would actually be an AF because hexadecimal over 9 goes then up to 15 with the letters A, B, C, D and E and if we had all of these set to in this block all of these bits turned on then we would have FF because this section is F and this is F and then if in this number we made this let's say the fourth bit here which on its own would be an 8 then this number in hexadecimal would be 8FF and so on and I'm sure you get the idea and this means it's very easy with hexadecimal when you split all the bits up in a number in groups of four 
to tell which bits are set and which aren't in the number. In decimal, I don't know what this number would be, it would be massive, but it would be impossible to tell. And we'll be using hexadecimal to mask, which I'll also explain, so don't worry, our various features out of our move. So, now that's as clear as mud, probably, let's go back to looking at our move. And the first thing we want to do is we move from a square. So we're going to set the from square. And remember I said that we needed to occupy... I think I said we needed to occupy seven bits, didn't I? Or did I say six bits? I can't even remember now. Um, I'm going to have to go back to... So, so I said we had a 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So we've got there seven bits that we need yet to occupy for our move. So our from is going to occupy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 bits in this way. And what we're going to do is our 2 square, we're going to make that occupy these 7 bits. What have I managed to do there? Like so. Sorry, I've got myself confused there by not being able to type correctly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7. So our 2 square is actually going to be positioned like this, because what we'll be doing when we want to access the 2 square is actually shifting these bits here, 7 bits, in the right direction to get the 2 square. And you'll see how that works in probably the next video, because I don't want this one to be too long. We're already by 6.5 minutes. What we next need to look at is the piece that we've captured. Now we know that our pieces go from up to 12, although a black king will never get captured. But if they go up to 12, then we can safely inside the first four bits of 1, 2, 4, 8, we can safely, inside four beats, store a captured piece, which is what we'll do. And then what I'm going to ask is, OK, maybe the move was an ampersand capture. So. I'll set a, this bit to represent whether the move was an on percent capture or not. And then I'm going to set this bit to represent whether the move was a pawn start or not. And now I've realized with horror that I'm actually going to need another load of bits. So I'm going to shift everything along so that we've got seven columns. OK, so once I've got the pawn start, the next thing I want to store is if we promoted, what piece did we promote to? So again, we need four bits, promoting to either a bishop, a rook, a queen, or a knight. So they can go in there. And last but not least, on the end, we're going to say, was the move a castling move? And in fact, I didn't need this extra row on here on the end at all, never mind. So castle and promoted piece. So there's no code actually in this video, but this is explaining how in one integer, because remember we've got 31 bits available, we're actually storing the various parts of our move. So the first seven bits are the from, the next seven bits are the two square, the next four bits are the piece captured, if any, it'll just be a zero. The next bit is whether it was non-passant capture, the next four bits, what type of piece, if any, was promoted, so what was the piece we promoted to? And this final bit on the end here is then, was it a castle move? And this allow us to, allows us to use bit shifting and bitwise and operations to ask the question, was the move an ampersand, was it a castle, and to get the various pieces out. And it's a much more efficient way, if you think about it, than storing a move in a structure that contains an integer for from, an integer for to, an integer for captured, an integer for this, an integer for that. It's a much more efficient way of actually storing it, particularly when you think that in our history structure here, we just need to store one integer as the move rather than storing a whole structure with all this information in it because we've got enough bits available inside the move. OK then, so in the next video, we'll start defining some macros to actually get this information out and set this information inside a move. And maybe if I've got time in the next video, I'll also demonstrate that in the main function quickly to show you how that works. Thanks very much for watching. Comments, questions, criticisms, welcome on YouTube.